Our goal was to find golden trout, and lots of them. I knew the Upper Kern Basin was our best bet for a good adventure. But getting there was going to be tough. Should I look defeated? Are you defeated? Kind of. Why are you filming this? Because I love you. You're just wasting the, the cards. We only have so many cards! We're in the wilderness! For two weeks, we'd have to summit Eastern Sierra Passes ranging from 11,000 to 13,500 feet high. We'd average eight hours a day with 45 pound packs on our back. It would be four days before we'd even reach the upper curve, and roughly 27,000 feet of elevation gains and losses before finally returning back to the truck. But sooner or later, we are driven to climb these mountains and have a peek at one of these iconic fish with their kaleidoscope of color. This season, my goal was to introduce some friends to one of the most remote regions of the High Sierra. We set out to find groups of golden trout that have been isolated for more than a century. There is a catch, though. They are found in a most unlikely place. Precariously perched in isolated streams at elevations of over 10,000 feet and buried beneath snow half the year. Mount Whitney, on one hand, is the highest peak in the lower 48 states. Yet a stone's throw to the east sinks Death Valley, the lowest spot in North America. Our first stop was to check in with Phil Peaster, the Dean of Golden Trout, and garner information about this fish. Another ten bucks, I'll tell you to want to know. <laughs> I first made my backpacking trips here, the first major trips, back right after World War II. If you're a professional biologist like I am, you look at these things as evolutionary marvels. The average person doesn't give a blast about whether they're pure or not. He wants to catch a pretty trout. And we care because that's our job, our speaking of fishing game department, to, to be concerned with the purity of species. That's why we exist. So that, that's what motivated me to spend virtually my entire life up there trying to care for this thing. Packing two weeks of food for a trip into the backcountry is always a challenge. Steaks taste best, but in reality we have to go super lightweight. And that means taking a bunch of freeze-dried food that tastes like sawdust in a cup. But that's the balance we have to maintain. After packing our food, we spend a night in the Alabama hills before heading out the next day. Then I found out that a Sierra Club group was going into an area near where we were setting up our base camp on the Upper Kern. It was a perfect opportunity to poach two sides of a mule. When I was a kid, I believed golden trout were native to all the High Sierra. But in fact, most of the Sierra was totally barren of fish. The Kern tributaries, which are the home of golden trout, were isolated about 10,000 years ago by volcanic flows. This physical isolation resulted in a genetic drift and the divergence of the golden trout from the rainbow trout. Golden trout are native to only a few tiny and spare tributaries of the Kern River. Its headwaters emerge at elevations of over 12,000 feet, one of the highest river sources in North America. Kern splits the Great Western Divide from the slightly higher eastern escarpment of the Sierra where peaks rise to over 14,000 feet. Despite their limited range, golden trout were destined to travel. And travel north they did. First of all, bit by bit, in the infamous coffee can plants of the late 19th century. Next, by past sheep herders, tired of eating mutton every day. As time progressed, coffee cans gave way to milk buckets and horses. Sierra Clubbers and Department of Fish and Game began moving the fish to otherwise uninhabited stretches of the Sierra. By the 1920s, golden trout were 200 miles north. Yet back on the upper Kern, golden trout became threatened in their original habitat. First rainbow trout were planted, which they hybridized with, and then brown trout were planted, which eat them. Nevertheless, the golden trout flourished, not at home, but outside of their original habitat. While it was exciting to be among the first people of the season to go into the historic golden trout habitat, once the higher passes were free of snow, the upper Kern Basin beckoned.
These mountains care nothing about you. They have no opinion at all. It's not man versus nature out here. Not until you start the relentless ascent of your first pass to get into the High Sierra that this really sets in. Luckily, mountain storms don't last forever, and they bring a little gift with them. Evenings of perfectly tranquil lakes, and the hatches begin again, and the trout rise. Hike, climb, fish. This became our mantra and rhythm for our entire journey. No, you're, you passed him though, strip. Yeah, no, he was moving at you though. Now he's angled off to your right a little bit. There he is. Yeah, oh, you don't like it. This isn't the Pyrenees, the Dolomites, the Alps, or the Rockies for that matter. But it is one of the few places in the world where you can climb alpine peaks and fish for trout. When traveling into the remote Sierra, I pick routes that allow me to fish the way in. The fact is, trout are all over the place in the Sierra. Take Bubs Creek, for example. On this stream, there's an opportunity to fish for about every species of trout known. You can catch brook trout, rainbows, browns. You can catch rainbow golden hybrids. And up high, of course, you start running into the golden trout themselves. Traipsing across the High Sierra looks alluring in photographs, but the reality is much more brutal. These days are long. The mountains are simply sweat, dust, and exhaustion. All you think about is water to keep hydrated and sleep. Everything in our pack serves a purpose. There's no superfluous gear brought along. Even our spoons are made of titanium. We bring the lightest down sleeping bags, the lightest foam pads, the lightest packs. But then some people throw it all out the window. Do you need a bunch of fancy gear to go into the mountains? Everybody knows the old theory that cotton kills, but that doesn't really apply to Ted. And if you want to end your trip real fast, blow your feet. Anytime you feel a hot spot on your foot, don't think it's going to go away. Everybody has different theories on how to take care of their feet. I wear liners and wool socks and mountain boots. But Ted wears work boots. He doesn't care. In the mountains, even a rich cracker taco is delicious. Good. Guidebooks aside, I really learned to cultivate a friendship with the people who live and work there. The trail crews. They know the mountains inside and out. A you just ravine. keep going up this. And what's, what do you call this one here? Three Bay. Three Bay? Oh, yeah. I got you. The climb, that one. Table? Yeah. All the way through Elizabeth Pass. Awesome. And Anybody can get across the Sierra. Nevertheless, experience teaches you to find your own rhythm, to find your own pace. It's just constant breathing and one more step. But then again, we had the Ravel brothers along, both national casting champions. They gallop across the Sierra. After days on our feet, we got our first glimpse into the upper Kern Basin. Here at the edge of Lake South America, we set up our base camp. Can't get 
honest thing, this thing is a fuck design. <laughs> 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 the mountains are cold, even in August. <laughs> Did you get that, George? Little popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work for coffee. Man. <laughs> After living off raisins and freeze-dried food, we knew we were about to have a feast. Exactly on time, Dave's pack train nosed over the head wall and dropped into our base camp. I think we spent like two hours just gorging. We had 27 sausages, cooked brisket. So you get the proper insertion into the sausage. Soy milk, fruit. I found a good sized pan over there. We could do it with some olive oil. Yeah, I, I got a little olive oil. Some brisket in a stove. We're just gonna have to slice it up into little bits, you know? I'm just trying to think yeah. how the best way to get this out of the package. I just cut this slip a little. Yeah, just there. figure it out which is. So, four at a time. Yeah. Great. Here's this. Ah! In my face! Go oh, turn it down. Turn it down. After an epic feast, we were back to the usual. We traipsed across to Lake South America to fish. For me, it was another circle completed. I was back on the batch of cirques in the Upper Kern. Here was a place that Ted and I had been pining to explore since we'd been here three years before. Before us were several days to hike, climb, fish, and fill in more blanks on our own personal maps. Above loomed the ragged crest of the Great Western Divide, chiseled by eons of ancient glaciers. Morning came and we were back on the trail again. Now we were hiking cross country, headed for Lake of the Fish, Sheep Herders Camp, Three Bay Lake, and Miners Camp. A big part of exploration is the allure of the unknown. We we're about to find out what kind of fish lived up here. It wasn't long before we were casting the liquid gold. Each new drainage is dripping with fresh possibilities. And by evening, we descended into sheep herders' camp. There's nothing quite as cool as hanging out in a camp established by sheep herders over a century ago. Here's Three Bay. In addition to our quest for liquid gold, Trail workers James and Jordan had introduced us to the intriguing possibility of rediscovering an old miner's camp. High on the Great Western Divide, this mine and its surrounding cirques became our Ultima Thule. Here we were at the furthest distance from our start, a solid five-day hike back to our truck. Expect to find the unexpected in the High Sierra. Not only did we find Goldens, we found these strange speckled rainbows. They looked like nothing we'd seen before. Here we found the mother load. There are a few other trout found in the High Sierra, notably the Kern River Rainbow, more like a red band you'd find on the McLeod. And never going to see a trout like this anywhere else. It's a hybrid. I call it a frankenfish. With lightweight rods and ultra-fine tippet, Fish race to tiny dancing dry flies on every cast. Did I GPS it? Could I ever find my way back there? Hmm, it might take a bit to pry that out of any of us. Though we'd found our fish, their future was on our minds. The historically fishless Sierra is a landscape much altered. By 1890, approximately 90,000 sheep were brought in for summer grazing in Yosemite Valley alone. One of the first officers of Sequoia reported an estimated 500,000 sheep on the Kern and Kings River. Both sheep and cattle destroy stream banks, a controversy that recently reached the front page of the LA Times. Phil Peaster lived through this once before. Then, in came the cows. You 
the state fish was on jeopardy, in jeopardy of being eradicated. If they were eradicated, if there are no more golden trout, you're not going to find any more fish. See, that's the wilderness. It's the golden trout wilderness where these things live. And should you have cows in the wilderness area? That's a good philosophical question. As a biologist, we say no, but still that shows you how close we are to losing species. And the golden trout could easily have fallen into that. They're in the South Fork current. We were quiet on our return to base camp. Now we were going home. People ask me, is it really worth it to go to so much work for a trout? I'll leave that to you. We were tired. We were hungry. People had come and people had gone along our trip. Our friendships were deeper and our experiences broader. The Sierra continues to beckon.